Yep, yep, to the yep, yep. You already know what time it is, man. It's your girl, POC. Turn your radios up, spread the word, spread the message. You already know how we come in each and every Friday live, 900 AM WRD, 96.1 word radio, man. You got to get up anyway, so why not get up with me each and every Friday? Starting at 10 AM, we give you that good environmental justice conversation that's for you and about you, making sure everyone in the greater Philadelphia has that good information, that news. But when, right now, we're talking about reimagining safety, right? I know that safety, violence, gun violence has been a topic all year. Can y'all, can y'all believe we are literally at the end of the month? It's almost Thanksgiving. Like, it's crazy. But yes, you know, when we talk about safety, we want to reimagine that. And what does that look like? We want to put solutions on the table. And some folks out here in the city of Philadelphia is definitely doing that. They're, they just attended a panel discussion where they were talking about reimagining safety and they actually dropped the documentary about it at the same time. So I want to invite two people onto the line with us this morning. We got Alex and Miss Movido on the line. Good morning. How are you all feeling this morning? Excellent. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. I'm well, thank you. How you doing? I'm good. Alex, I want you to definitely go ahead and get a chance to introduce yourself before we get into the conversation. Ms. Mobita, I want you to do the same. Sure. So my name's Alex Vitale. I'm a professor of sociology at Brooklyn College in the CUNY Graduate Center. And I also teach in the African American Studies Department at Brooklyn. And I've been working for decades on trying to figure out how to get the police out of our lives in as many ways <laughs> as we possibly can. You're starting up some conversation with that one, police out of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Ms. Movita, I want to take the time to give you as well to introduce yourself. Good morning. I am Movita Johnson, Harola, social worker by trade and training, 30 years in. I am also a five-time co-victim of homicide and also a returning citizen working to protect our communities on both sides of the gun. No doubt. And thank you both for the work that you're doing. Um, and Alex, I want to start with you, you know, just even with that blunt statement, you said working with communities to get the police out of our lives. What does that even look like for people? Well, we've been given this false choice for so long that if we want to have more safety, we, we either get police or we get nothing. Mm -hmm. And this has, you know, made people to uh, lean into thinking that somehow the police are, are the key tool to, to making us safe, often out of a kind of desperation. But in Philadelphia, you got a city filled with police and nobody's safe. People don't feel safe. So we need to create new choices, new options for people to break up that false choice. So for instance, I've been working in Newark, New Jersey the last six months where they took money out of the police budget to create an office of violence prevention and trauma recovery that funds a whole ecosystem of community-based organizations that have brought violent crime rates to a 60-year low in Newark mm. by trying to lift people up, repairing harms, improving conditions in the community, creating more stability for families and individuals rather than endlessly, pointlessly criminalizing and brutalizing people. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the environment, right, we talk about the disparities that we see within different sections um, or different communities of the city, especially like one in Philadelphia. Ms. Mobita, how would you say like environmental uh, disparities play in this, this idea of reimagining safety? Yeah, so when you look at other communities, not ur not urban communities like Philadelphia, you see that they have lower rates of violence because they have lower rates of filth in their community, right? They're not typically dealing with some of the issues that we're dealing with, like toxins in our water, toxins in our schools, toxins in our soils. There has actually been studies that have been conducted that shows that there is a correlation between dirty communities and high rates of community violence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Alex, when we get back into the documentary or when we talk about the documentary, because you both were just recently on a panel, I'm um, really breaking this conversation down. Uh, you know, when we get to the documentary, where do you see the intersections coming from as far as just violence, um, gun violence, and then environmental justice issues or social justice issues in general? Well, we know, as Movita pointed out, that there is a strong, well-researched connection between environmental conditions and the levels of violence in the community. Uh, one area where Philadelphia has been making some small progress, or at least it's on the horizon, is with improving the number of street trees 
and backyard trees in, in people's uh, uh, yards. They just got a significant grant from the federal government to, to, to dramatically expand the availability of street trees. And we know that street trees reduce violence. Mm. They keep the temperature down. They also are associated with lower levels of hypertension, heart disease, and other kinds of public health problems. And so when we invest in improving the, the physical environment for people, the natural environment, we are going to save more lives than any number of police arrests do. The, the other thing I would just mention is okay. the, role, the role of lead. You know, it's possible that the presence of lead in the, in the bodies of poor people because it's always more concentrated in poor people because of lead paint, because of living next to highways when we use leaded gasoline, was a major, major factor in the uptick in crime that we experienced in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And that much of the crime drop that we had over the last 30 years, even though we have problems today, it's much better than it was 30 years ago, is because we took lead out of gasoline. Mm -hmm. So this is all part of deconstructing this idea that the only possible tool we have to address our public safety issues is sending people with guns around to terrorize people. Yes, um, Alex, you made a really good point. And Mobita, that makes me want to get into the next question with you, um, because Alex talked about public safety and also about public health, right? And I want to specifically hone in on the public health aspect, because when we think about the documentary, right, um, Reimagining Safety, where where do you see the public health conversation coming into, um, you know, our communities? So the one thing that we know is that trauma is very alive and real in communities of color, right? And the police have historically been a part of the trauma that has been perpetuated on communities of color. If you look at the history of policing in this country, it started with slave catchers, right? Who used to be KKK members and things of that nature. But when we talk about urban communities, and communities that are historically traumatized, we typically talk about mental health disparities and those types of trauma and drug and alcohol um, addictions, but we don't typically talk about physical trauma that occurs to people, right? We don't talk about the high rates, which also is directly correlated to the environmental injustice. We don't talk about the hypertension that resides in communities of color, how people are living with chronic health conditions like diabetes. All of those are not just um, connected to environmental issues, but they're also connected to the trauma that exists in our communities because of the high rates of violence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I appreciate that answer. And Alex, you know, I want to ask you a documentary question as well, just to get a better understanding. Um, when it comes down to the documentary, would you say that this documentary engages a better conversation between community members and activists or people who are just passionate about the things that we're passionate about? Do you feel like this documentary engages them enough to be able to break it down for them to see or truly understand what's happening in our city or in cities in general? Well, I think it's an, an important step. You know, it's it's trying to to make what seems like a, a an abstract idea much more concrete for people, and the voices in the documentary represent a broad range of communities and backgrounds. Uh, but but there's it it always takes more than just one documentary or one conversation, right? This right. has to be about thousands of conversations between people in their own communities around real agendas for public safety. You know, like, why is it that when we have an uptick in gun violence, the only new resource we can have is more police and more prosecutions instead of a trauma recovery center, instead of more engagement with young people in crisis, more supports for families in need, you know? And so we need those kinds of campaigns every day to be the focal point for these kinds of conversations. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Movita, you know, by you being in the in the streets, you know, you being in the city of Philadelphia, boots on the ground, what kind of stories do you hear as far as testimonies from people who are living in these sections of the city where they feel as though their environment is creating the unsafe spaces or creating the violent community in which they live in? So the the one thing that I'm hearing that 
it seems to be consistent is people are feeling hopeless, right? Because they come out of their doors, there's filth everywhere. They, they don't have, um, appropriate places to shop for food. You know, we got housing scarcity, we got food deserts in Philadelphia, and this creates a sense of hopelessness in the community, right? Where they feel like they don't even have a choice. And then they reach out to the people who are supposed to be leaders in their community for help, and they receive no help. So we have to address the issues, the environmental injustice issues in our communities. We have to put hope back in the people who live here because the constant thing that I'm hearing on the streets is look at where we live, right? Mm -hmm. Why would our children feel hopeful living in these conditions? And then on top of that, the disinvestment in our communities where, you know, our children can't get a good education. We're not even talking about the schools and mm -hmm. the conditions of the schools with this bestest and lead, right? But their children can't get a good education. They can't get a job. Like there's a sense of hopelessness, not just in Philadelphia, but across this country. And let me ask you a second question, just to piggyback on what you said. Do you think with this new administration that's coming in, we do have some hope? Can we hold on to a little bit of that Obama hope with this next administration? <laughs> I, I don't think so. Um, my, my, the sad part for me is that, you know, we have a candidate that ran on stop and frisk, right? Mm -hmm. Which historically has been... Um, to target black and brown men. Not only that, when, when we have a person that's coming into the mayor seat, that's talking about bringing the, the National Guard into Philadelphia to militarize the city, that's talking about hiring more police, when the conversations we should be having is how are we going to address the social determinants of community violence so that we can reduce police presence and give the people who live in these communities the authority to police themselves, right? Mm -hmm. We know that if we, address homelessness, if we address food deserts, if we address poverty, if we address disinvestment, we know that violence will be reduced, right? People want out, but we got to give them a door. So when we talk about stopping frisk, you know, the National Guard, hiring more police, that is very concerning for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Alex, how does this documentary per, uh, per se, why would you say that it addresses marginalized communities in a way where the conversation can go keep going outside of the panel discussion, outside of someone watching the documentary? Because like you said, it takes more than just one documentary. So, you know, how can we continue the conversation within these marginalized communities to keep going further? Well, I think that really needs to be done around concrete organizing campaigns. And that means, you know, talking to people in neighborhoods. That means standing in front of the corner bodega with a clipboard and having these conversations and inviting people to a town hall meeting. And, you know, there is work like that underway in Philadelphia and cities across the country, but, you know, it doesn't get support from the big foundations and it's looked on suspiciously by politicians who rely on police to cover up their lack of a real plan to address the problems in the community. You know, this new mayor in Philadelphia does not have a plan to fix the schools, does not have a plan to address homelessness, does not have a plan to put young people to work, and is going to rely on the police to cover up those political failures. And we need community organizing and community power to, to demand real solutions to those community problems. Definitely. And that actually leads to my next question. Um, Alice, would you say that the film, the documentary actually specifically highlighted any initiatives or policies which will help bridge the gap between the disparities that we see in the city of Philadelphia, where there's environmental justice or social justice issues? You know, I don't think there's much in the film that addresses this uh, terribly important issue of environmental justice. And I, and I wish it did address that more. And I think Maybe what we really need is another film that does that. And I would just recommend that people take a look at Derricka Purnell's amazing book, Becoming Abolitionists. Hmm. You know, she grew up in a very poor part of St. Louis, was part of the Ferguson uprising. And one of the chapters in that book just talks about the ways in which the vulnerability to police violence and the vulnerability to environmental degradation have gone hand in hand for poor people of color throughout American history. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you for dropping that uh, that tip. First and foremost, I'm like, hmm, I need to look that up myself <laughs> for sure. And, you know, when it comes down to uh, just the overall, because you all just like, again, just wrapped up the panel discussion. You had the showing of the documentary here in the city of Philadelphia. Um, I'm going to ask you both the same question. You know, as people sit back and they watch this or they're getting to a, more familiar with the documentary, what do you actually want them to get out of it? You know, when we say reimagining safety, uh, Ms. Mobita, I would start with you. Like, what do you want people to get out of watching this? film. Yeah, so I want people to start having the real conversation, right, on how we will defund the police. People see it as something that we can't do because when when they hear defund the police, they think it means total abolition um, of the police department, right? But that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is take that money that you would be putting into policing and to really harassing communities of color and put it into social services, put it into things that will provide what's necessary for people to reduce violence in their own communities, right? So I think the film is just so critical in being able to open up these conversations, especially in the communities that need it most, because we know that hurt people hurt people, but we also yeah. know that heal people heal people. <laughs> That's a good one. And Alex, what would you like for people to take away from the film, you know, as they get more familiar with it? I think just, you know, breaking down this idea that, that police and jails and prisons are the only possible tools we have to make our community safer places. You know, anything we can do to, to disassemble that idea and present people with other options that they could, you know, build into their demands for, for healthier, safer, more prosperous communities. Mm -hmm. And Alice, I wouldn't be myself if I didn't ask this question because you started off the conversation pretty much um, giving us an example of a success story. You, you know, you're working in Newark, New Jersey. They had some success up there, you know, and as we we got into our conversation, we we expanded a little bit about um, how we feel about our um, our next mayor of Philadelphia or the new mayor of Philadelphia. But at the same time, when we look at Philly, like, do you feel like some success stories as far as reducing gun violence, reducing violence in general, bringing that homicide numbers down? Do you feel like we will have some success stories in the new, near future? You know, Philadelphia does have a, a community of people working at the grassroots level to try to break the cycle of violence. You've got some violence interrupters. You've got some people in the hospital system. You know, you've got some cure violence groups. Uh, but the problem is you, it's not being done to scale and it doesn't have the resources that it needs to achieve the kind of effectiveness that we've seen in Newark. So I think it's possible, and I think it's even possible to move this new mayor in the direction of, of better funding that infrastructure. And I think that that should be a, a key demand for folks who, who are serious about trying to re really reduce the violence and create real safety. And can I add something oh, yeah, I was to gonna the say, end of that? Yep, yes, ma'am. So here's the thing. We have had success in Philadelphia. You know, a lot of people know that I ran for office. I didn't run for office because I wanted to be a politician. I got tired of running around begging politicians to do what was necessary to protect our communities. Um, I ran and I won in 2019 and I went up for a very specific reason. I wanted GVI funded. We did it here in Philadelphia in 2013-14. Severely underfunded strategy. We had a 50% reduction in gun violence in the first year of a severely underfunded strategy and nobody would fund it. I mm. spent the next seven and a half years of my life fighting to get GBI funded. I went up to Harrisburg as a six month freshman, no history in politics, didn't even like civics class in high school, bought back $1.3 million for GBI. The study came out on February 28th. The pilot, there is over a 50% reduction in gun violence in the pilot of GBI strategies like that. It works everywhere that it goes. It, it's a positive peer pressure model. It's a social service driven model. It offers that, you know, the top 3% in communities who shoot with everything that they need to be successful. And it provides the door. They want out, but there's no door. So hmm. strategies like that need to be expanded across the city. We don't need more police officers. We don't need more money going to the FOP. What we need is to provide evidence-based services, evidence-based strategies that have been proven effective. Can you break down that acronym for us really quickly for people who may not even know what that is? Absolutely. So GVI is actually Group Violence Intervention. And when we did it in 2013-14, it was actually called the Focus Deterrence Strategy. 
Awesome. I appreciate you breaking that down. And I want to ask you both to take time to give yourselves time to shout yourselves out individually if people want to find more information about you. And then also, Alex, can you break down how can people find more information about the documentary? How can they watch it? And if they want to share it to their students, you know, thank you for doing the work and being in the classroom. Um, and if they want to share it to their students, how can they do it as well? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, people can find me on social media, uh, and I wrote a best-selling book called The End of Policing that has a lot more information about uh, about these ideas and, and the work we're doing across the country and even internationally. And uh, the the film is not in general distribution yet. You know, we're, we're doing screenings all over the country. Uh, there is a website for the film. Uh, reimagining safety. So uh, people can check that out to see if there's a screening near them. Uh, let me see. The website is reimaginingsafetymovie.com. Reimaginingsafetymovie.com. Awesome. And Ms. Bovita, how can people find you and stay in touch with you? Yeah. So everybody that's reimagining safety dot safetymovie.com. It's a very powerful documentary. Please have screenings, invite, you know, the, the producer to come. Um, but I can be reached my website and all of my social media is Movita Johnson Harrell. Um, also there is a documentary out, a filmmaker from New York came and followed me for six years in my fight to protect communities on both sides of the barrel from the carceral and from the cemetery. And that is murders that matter. And that is out now on PBS POV. I appreciate you both. And I want to ask you one last green question before I let you go. You know, when we think about the city of Philadelphia, people always say that Philadelphia has no greenery, no scenery. There's not really much to, uh, you know, be offered when it comes to Philadelphia as far as an outdoor space, right? Um, do you see Philadelphia being pushed more into a, a greener, safer uh, city as far, as far as like getting more uh, solar panels, getting more, you know, spaces as far as taking down the toxins and the fuels and things of that nature. Do you see Philadelphia going into that greener space? Well, I hope so. I mean, this new tree initiative is one step in the right direction. It's low tech. It's green. It's green technology. It provides jobs potentially for young people to plant these new trees and to help maintain them. Uh, but yes, we've got to go much further in addressing corporate polluters. And we need to be part of a global climate change movement because climate change is going to undermine so much of the hard work that's being done at the local level if we allow temperatures to continue to spiral out of control. Thank you. Ms. Hobie, I want to ask you the same question. Do you see Philadelphia going in a safer, greener direction? Yeah, so on one hand, I say that we're doing some positive things. The Pennsylvania Horticultural Society is doing some great projects with actually engaging urban communities with greening. Right now, we do a program with youth between the ages of 14 and 18, where they are paid to come out to clean and green the community. Awesome. Um, but then on the other hand, I say that no, because gentrification continues to skyrocket in Philadelphia. Development continues to go on in Philadelphia. We're pushing people out of their natural habitats. So I think we got we have a situation where we have to find some balance and we have to make sure that number one we aren't pushing people out of their communities and number two the green spaces that we have that we need to keep and we need to add on to agreed we're going to drop the mic just like that remember as reimagining safety movie.com make sure you click that link so you can see where the next screening will be and how you can get a screening next to you as well i appreciate you both i hope you both have a great weekend thank you so much thank you Thanks. No doubt. We about to go to a quick commercial break. Right after this quick commercial break, we got more lined up here on 900 AMWRD 96.1 Word Radio. It's your girl PLC. We'll be right back.